Hello, welcome to this video and on this video I'm going to be looking at my 10 greatest heavy metal albums, right? So um, I think it's almost impossible to become up with the objective list of heavy metal albums and so I've I've gone for the title My Greatest. So what that means is, 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 is this is really my personal view of the greatest 10 heavy metal albums. That's slightly different to my 10 favourite heavy metal albums, but to me, these would be the 10 greatest. Uh, the first problem you have with this list is really deciding what heavy metal is. I think, you know, when I got into heavy metal in 1980 and I bought Axe Attack, this album said it was a collection of heavy metal and when you look at the bands that are on that album you know was the gillen band heavy metal really would that be classed as heavy metal now you know blue oyster cult would that be classed as heavy metal so i think there's an issue um of what we define as heavy metal and um the way that that has changed and i've tried to accommodate on this video because I've, so I've actually asked some young people from a young, new, up and coming heavy metal band to give me their top tens, and you'll get that at the end of the video. So stick around for that, you know. So I'm trying my best to be fair. But of course, what you're gonna get today is a 50 year old, 50 year old new wave of British heavy metal fans, you know, version of what heavy metal is. And I've really tried to take in albums that I feel that, you know, important in terms of the definition um, and creation of the heavy metal genre. Um, I'm working on a thing called the Dom History of Heavy Metal. I've done part one or everywhere. I've looked at Black Sabbath. And I think it's not just about, you know, heavy guitarists and guitar solos. That could be heavy rock. That's hard rock. I think heavy metal has... It, it has to have those horror or science fiction overtones to it. It has to have a certain element um, sort of that is filmic almost. Uh, it, the imagery is so important to saying that this is heavy metal and this isn't heavy metal. It's not just the sound. And that hopefully will, you know, emerge as a theme as we go through this video. So um, shall I kick off with my 10, you know, greatest heavy metal albums? Let's have a go. Um, this is going to be difficult. Some of these bands I'm fans of, I'm no expert on as well. You know, um, and my expertise lies with prog and fusion and i'm sure that prog and fusion you know is going to influence these as well it definitely influenced what i got at number 10. so at number 10 i often like to pick something left field an outlier something that's a bit strange there's something that people go oh god i didn't expect that to be on the list so at number 10 i changed this at the last minute you know i did have holy diver by dio in at this point and I took this off and I replaced it with Nothing Face by Voivod. Now, Voivod are a Canadian thrash metal band with progressive rock overtones. Um, they made a series of albums to the 80s which really explored the sort of nether regions of thrash metal. For, for many people, their um, 1988 album, Dimension Hartress album, is an absolute masterpiece of thrash metal. And I think it is, I've listened to it, but for my ears, they then, on this album from 1989, they then bring in progressive rock album uh, influences. This is uh, progressive metal, and I've been a bit negative about progressive metal, but Nothing Face, this album is just unbelievable. It's what I imagine progressive metal should be. It has this dirty, nasty, scary, comic book science fiction horror elements of metal it doesn't sacrifice that often with progressive metal it either sounds like some sort of hair metal band or it sounds like sort of anal retentive teenagers trying to show off their clever that's my problem with it with voivod i just don't get that at all they seem to have a vision and an approach and these arrangements although they're complex they sort of spin out of control for their it, it's incredible um, incredible album which is just jaw dropping and um, when I explored the catalogue of Voivod which is only recently and I'm still exploring it and I'm no expert I expected the 80s albums to be sort of undone by 80s production but they're not at all they sound incredible 
Um, and I'm sure there's many albums that have come in after Nothing Face that I'm not aware of that are equally incredible. But this album just seems to be so such a defining moment for metal. Um, the funny thing is, is when this album came out in 1989, my friends who were metal fans kept saying to me, Andy, you must check this album out by Voivod. And I never did. If I had, it would they would I'd be talking about one of my favourite bands. And I think it's what what it is, it's that Frank Zappa and especially King Crimson influence coming into metal. But this is an out and out metal album, I assure you. I haven't shoehorned in some progressive rock album onto my list. This is out and out brutal metal. Right, and it's supplanted two bands on that would have been on this list. One is Slayer and one is Megadeth. They would have been on this list as well. Um, I didn't want to just fill it up with thrash bands and I could have easily, easily done that because I'm a massive thrash metal fan. So um, they're on this list, Voivod, and I'm sure this is going to elicit a big response from the watchers of this uh, channel because I'm sure, you know, Voivod's never been mentioned. No one's ever said it in the comments. But Goddy, you're wrong. You should have told me. Where's the Voivod? Why haven't you talked about Voivod? You know, I should be talking about them on this channel. And I have finally, and I have put them in an honourable place in my greatest heavy metal albums of all time list. There they are at number 10. Right, so was that a good start? I think that was a pretty good start to my list. I'm quite happy with that one. So what have I got at number 9? Okay. Um, I came up in the new wave of British heavy metal era um, metal changed and I think and I'll get into this in my history as I get through my history of heavy metal it's the influence of punk on heavy rock bands that really um, creates the new ever British heavy metal in 1980 I come in to music in 1980 that's become when I become a huge fan that's when I started playing the drums because of new wave of British heavy metal but it wasn't just those albums that were important. There was one album that was so important at that time to my generation, and that was Blizzard of Oz by Ozzy Osbourne. Um, this is what I've got at number nine. Uh, I think this album is seminal in the development of heavy metal because Black Sabbath are so important in the. They are the they are the originators of heavy metal, and that sort of horror Im imagery is so important to the, the grain of heavy metal. I think um, Sabbath, um, as they go on, they start to explore so many different areas and they're almost like progressive rock, but they're also sort of winding out of control. And a lot of that is because of Ozzy's, you know, drug use and chaotic, you know, sort of life. And so eventually they sack Ozzy and they get Ronnie James Dio in. And I think Dio coming in post-punk and they harden up the sound and I could have well put Heaven and Hell in at this point. Um, but, of course, Sabbath's on my list <laughs> later on. Uh, what a surprise then when Ozzy hooks up with the genius that was Randy Rhodes and makes this album. And this is a seminal heavy metal album for me. Um, one band that I don't think is on this list is UFO and Michael Schenker um, also needs to be mentioned. And, of course, Eddie Van Halen. But that sort of in the the introduction of that sort of neoclassical sound to metal, and it, that also comes from Uli John Roth. There's all these musicians we can talk about, but for me, for my generation, the new wave of British heavy metal generation, the album was Blizzard of Oz by Ozzy Osbourne. It was Crazy Train, Mr. Crowley. That was the stuff, you know. Randy Rhodes, absolute genius. You know, Ozzy was able to go from a sort of Basically, his career's over, he's washed up, he's uh, and all that. As soon as he hooked up with Randy Rhodes, he was back, you know. And Ozzy's an important character in the history of heavy metal. I think um, there's a good argument for being on the list. It's just a brilliant album, it's an absolutely classic album that is then goes to influence the sound of heavy metal so much throughout the 80s and, and right up to present day. Um, and the fact that in 1982, as soon as this has happened. Randy Rhodes is dead after jumping in a plane and trying to dive bomb Ozzy, you know, on tour and killing himself in the process. Um, it, it has made this era of Ozzy so special and unique in the history of heavy metal. So I think those are all the reasons why I've got on. And it's, it's out and out heavy metal. There's, no one's going to deny that Blitz of Oz by Ozzy Osbourne is not heavy metal. So that's what I got at number nine, right? Number eight. 
I knew I had to put an album by Judas Priest on this list. When I look at my dumb history of heavy metal, after we've talked about Black Sabbath, the most the, 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 the next band that really are the architects of the next stage of heavy metal is going to be Judas Priest. And I'm going to be talking a lot about Judas Priest's integration of sort of S&M leather gay bikers, you know, imagery, which as a kid was so important. I was into heavy metal because of there were three tracks that take, took me towards heavy metal. In February 1980, Rainbow brought out All Night Long. Now, is that a heavy metal track? I don't know. But that alerted me to a certain sound. The guitar riffs, I loved it. In the summer of 1980, Judas Priest brought out United. And seeing him on top of the pops in the full leather gear was really impressive. And I wanted all that leather gear. All us kids wanted that. We want the study. We didn't know that that would that come from like S&M and, and sort of uh, um, the sort of hell bent for leather gay imagery. We didn't know that, but I wanted the wristbands, I wanted the studded neckband, you know, I wanted all that. And so Judas Priest is so important, and Judas Priest are also very important of taking that sound of Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath, but accelerating it, bringing in the 16th notes bass lines, bringing in the double bass from the 16th note, which is going to be the foundation of heavy metal. Judas Priest are integral to the development of heavy metal. So which album are we going to put on? Well, originally I put on... Painkiller, because it's just an incredible metal album. So that was my first choice. I thought, no, it needs to be one of the early albums. Well, it's got to be British Steel, hasn't it? Because that's their crossover album, 1980. They come out of British Steel. It chimes in with the new wave is British heavy metal. Post-punk, heavy metal. There we are, British Steel. It's the album that did it for me. United, I saw it on the telly. It's got to be British Steel. I thought, yeah, but they're, they're, they're doing this beforehand. So when you look at the history of Judas Priest, the first album, Rock Roller, is a real sort of post Led Zepp Black Sabbath album. They're all dressed like hippies at that point. They start quite there. We start to see the, you know, um, with um, um, Tadwigs of Destiny, we start to see it on the, the second album. But I feel the sound's nailed on the third album, Sin After Sin. And that's the album I'm going to put on the list. I know it's a little bit contentious. I think stained glass that comes in, that's where they then bring in this sort of leather, studded leather imagery. And that really just nails what heavy metal is at that point. So stained glass could well be the album that we, we have on this list. But for me, it's sin after sin. I had all the Judas Priest albums when I was growing up. There was one that was head and shoulders above all the rest. All the rest and it was sin after sin. And the reason was because it had Simon Phillips on drums. Um, you could see them floundering around with drummers in the 70s because they, they're after a sound, but they haven't got a drummer to pull that sound off. Uh, in the end, they have to pull in a jazz fusion virtuoso in Simon Phillips who is able to do that double bass drum thing. And that sound is on the album, but I feel that the track Descendant Aggressor is really the beginning of modern metal. So it's 76, I really think that that track, if you put it on now, sounds like out and out thrash metal. It's the beginning and the end, you know. And I still feel that one of the greatest moments in heavy metal history is the beginning of Descendant Aggressor with that sort of ominous build up that just gets louder and louder then that stop and you hear that sort of harmonized scream. And then Rob Halford lets out the first line of the of the of this song and that first line is ah canyons that's metal it's only metal you can get away with that there's no hippies there's no reggae artists there's no funk you know james brown cannot do that it's only heavy metal when you could open up a song by shouting ah canyons and what are these canyons of space and time canyons of space and time this is what metal is. Judas Priest, sin after sin. Right, I know everyone's going to be saying, no, it should be British, it should be this, this, or that. No, 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 I'm right, I'm right. Descendant Aggressor, that's where it's at. It's not, Sad Winds of Destiny, it's, it's there in embryo. If that's the point where I would say heavy metal is born. No one else says that, but I do. So that's where we're at, it's my channel, and I say what goes, so that's it. So that's what I've got at number eight. Okay, so... What have I got at number seven? Well, 
I am a product of the new wave of British heavy metal era, right? The new wave of British heavy metal was the gateway to prog. It was the gateway to jazz fusion and jazz rock. It was the gateway for me then into like free jazz. Um, it was the gateway into hip hop. It was the, heavy metal was the gateway to uh, electronic music. Everything that you wouldn't associate. I'm here because of those new wave of British heavy metal bands in 1980s. I've said this a million times on this channel. As the 80s developed, sort of metal sort of, it, it slowly merged into this sort of horrible hair metal American, you know, sort of Beavis and Butthead thing, you know, Winger and Poison and all those types of bands. And, you know, I try to like them. I love Dave Lee Roth and I love the Dave Lee Roth group. Um, but one night I'm sat listening to the Friday Rock Show and they play a track off the very first Metallica album. And I can remember going, oh my God, upgrade. Heavy metal upgrade has just come in. Those thrash metal bands that emerged were so important, right? I wanted to cover them all. As I've said, I'm not gonna have Megadeth on this list. I'm not gonna have Slayer on this list. I haven't got Sepultura on this list. Um, of all the thrash metal bands, my favorite, without doubt, was Anthrax, right? Saw Anthrax on the Persistence of Time tour. Incredible, with Living Colour opening up. Someone asked me, why don't you do great, you know, um, a video about the best sort of um, support bands that you've seen. The number one would be, I'll tell you now, it was Living, Living Colour opening up for Anthrax, but that's another story. Um, Anthrax were my favorite of the thrash metal bands. There was so much humour in there, but there was so much virtuosity there. Charlie Benante was the guy that was really exploring the blast beat. So I think he pretty much invented the blast beat. They were intelligent, they were open, they welcomed in hip-hop influence, funk influences, comedy influence, but they were deadly serious as well. They were they pulled in image-wise from a sort of, a lot of the time, it was almost like a sort of David Cronenberg version of horror. A lot of about an infection and all that spreading the disease and all that type of stuff. Absolutely incredible band. The album, without doubt, is going to be, for me, Among the Living. So that's what I've got at number um, seven, is Among the Living. Um, I have to mention the track that Anthrax then went on to do with Public Enemy. When they did that, that opened me up. And I'm going to do a video on Public Enemy because I'm a huge fan of a Public Enemy. But you know why I'm a huge fan of Public Enemy. It's because of Anthrax. And I can remember watching an interview with Anthrax where they were talking about Public Enemy. And they said, well, we grew up with them. But when we heard what they were doing, we just assumed that was the next stage of heavy metal. That is a very profound thing to realise and, and say, you know. Anthrax, they're by far the most creative, intelligent of all the 80s thrash metal bands um, and I really don't think they get the um, accolades that the other ones get and so that's why I've put them on the list. They, you know, Among the Living is by far my favourite thrash metal album. Uh, but we'll see what we've got later on, of course, as we go up. At number six, I have the mighty Pantera with the album Vulgar display of power. Pantera start off almost of like one of those sort of schlocky, heavy, you know, um, hair metal bands. You know, they're a little bit heavier than that, a little bit more, you know, the Cowboys from Hell. Um, but they do have a little touch of the sort of, you know, Southern American rock aesthetic. You know, there's a there was a touch of Lynyrd Skynyrd there, I think, a touch of a Ted Nugent, I suppose, you know. When Vulgar Display of Power Camp comes out and the first single, Mouth of War, they've cleaned everything up. They've taken what the thrash metal bands are doing, but I also think they've they, there's a tiny touch of the sort of doominess of Sabbath, but punched through grunge and some of the rap metal bands. It's they they they, they have their own take on thrash metal, which is really doomy and groovy. Why do we love Pantera? Because they groove. God, do they groove. Um, I can remember, I was aware of them, I'd heard Cowboys from Hell. I can remember sitting up one night, putting the TV on, 
it was a rock show and I switched it on and Mouth of War was on and I remember that was it. I went out and bought the album the next day and that album didn't let up. It wasn't like Mouth of War was the best one. Absolutely didn't let up all the way through. What an incredible album. Um, brilliant musicianship. You know, this is the era when metal bands used to play on their records. It wasn't a bunch of programmed, you know, quantized triggered drums and guitar solos that have been dialed in a note at a time, you know, and everything squashed through the compressors and tuned and programmed. It wasn't that, you know, this is a real band playing in the room and delivering that metal sound because they could deliver it. And I've got to say that Dimebag Daryl is or was a genius guitarist, absolute genius, that was able to take all that stuff that happened in the 80s, all the Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, but boil it down in a sort of non-virtuoso way. He, 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 has, he, he has elements of that in his, in his solos, but he also has a chaotic aspect where you feel like he doesn't really know what he's doing, you know. Scales and notes don't matter to him. It's much, much more about, I want to go from here to there and I'm going to go there my own way. I, I, I think that um, Dimebag Dabble's an incredible guitarist. His, his guitar solo on um, I'm Broken, which was on the following album, Far Beyond Driven, um, isn't one of the best guitar solos ever. But if... In my opinion, if you want to know what the greatest uh, Pantera album is, it's full of display of power. And I think it's one of the greatest heavy metal albums of all time. You know, if you're into metal, go and get it. You know, stop messing around. It's absolute uh... masterpiece. So at number five, I thought, am I going to put any grunge artist in? Am I going to put a grunge artist in? Is grunge heavy metal? It's a debatable question. If I'm going to put a grunge artist in there, it has to be Nirvana, never mind. Right, but I felt that the whole grunge movement, the, the, the accessibility of Nirvana, which deserves its own video, I don't want to explain why they were so accessible, why they influenced culture so much, why they changed everything, not just music, but films, fashion. Why were Nirvana so important? Uh, and it's, it's, it's their accessibility. Um, but there's a whole bunch of incredible um, grunge bands as well. You know, Stone Temple Pilots, Alice in Chains, Dirt Neely was in this position. You know that. He was nearly there. Pearl Jam. But for me, and they are the heaviest of them, it's Soundgarden. And it's a toss-up between Bad Motor Finger and Super Unknown. And I originally went for Bad Motor Finger because it's got Jesus Christ pose and that's one of the greatest heavy metal tunes ever written. But Black Hole Sun is... Top 10, one of the greatest songs of all time. This is high art. This is emotional songwriting, wrenched from the very soul. And it's heavy, really heavy. And it's progressive. And it's got all those odd times because there's a weird stuff going on. Beautifully recorded. It's a masterpiece. Super Unknown by Soundgarden is a masterpiece. And it features the greatest heavy metal, heavy rock singer that ever lived, Chris Cornell. I saw Chris Cornell a number of times live and he, every time he was absolutely astonishing, you know, with the, the sort of vocal power of a Graham Bonnet or a Ronnie James Dio, but, you know, performed almost like a lounge jazz singer. I can remember seeing him singing and just belt out these incredible notes with his mic held down here, completely relaxed, absolute God-given talent as a vocalist, unbelievable. And, he, and his voice, he, he was able to mine something in his voice that was so emotional. For me, he's, he's there with Billie Holiday. Uh, he's up there with um, uh, Lee Armstrong, Skip James, all my favourite singers, you know, Ray Charles, James Brown. He's up there with them all. He's one, he was such an incredible talent uh, and so many incredible albums. But that's who I've got at number five. He's super unknown by Soundgarden, representing grunge, which I think is integral to this story of heavy metal. So that's what I've got at number five. Right, what have we got at number four? Right. Um, I was telling you about um, how I got into heavy metal. Three, three singles. First, All, All Night Long by Juice Priest came out February... 1980. Then in the summer around about, you know, August, July, August, United by Judas Priest. And I'm buying these singles. I absolutely love them. Towards Christmas 1980, 
Motorhead bring out Ace of Spades. How many times have I mentioned this on this channel? That was it for me. Eclipsed everything else. Right? Um, Motorhead are the embodiment of all those progressive rock bands having to wind it in. I've spoken about this so much. Um, but you feel with Lemmy, he was dying to wind it in. It wasn't a compromise for him. <laughs> he was dying to wind it in. Because he's out and out rock and roll. He's in the tradition of Chuck Berry. He's in the tradition of Little Richard. He's in the tradition of MC5 and the Ramones. Okay? Um, when he goes from Hawk Queen and he forms Motorhead, which is an out and out rock and roll band, but a brutal, vicious rock and roll band, they then start to refine themselves over a series of albums that lands in 1980 with the Ace of Spades album. And I think this is so important. You know, when the thrash metal thing started to happen, for me, it just sounded like the logical extension of what Motorhead had done. You know, when Venom came out and then Metallica came out, it was a logical extension of that. You know, uh, Lemmy almost defines uh, heavy metal. The only thing that um, is different with Motorhead, I think, is the imagery. So rather than having that sort of horror or science fiction thing that is often holding hands with heavy metal, Motorhead has got a sort of um, almost like a British World War experience wound in there. And he's got sort of, this it, with the Ace of Spades, that sort of cowboy imagery all wound in. And I think it's these, these imagery things that are put into the mix that are so important to heavy metal. And I think Motorhead, that cowboy imagery and the sort of World War II, and, and I'm, a, I'm afraid in Lemmy's case, you know, with the Iron Crosses, all that, it's almost like that sort of, you know, Third Reich's Nazi imagery that he winds into heavy metal which is integral and we see that cropping up over and over again in so many bands you know um so i, I that's what i've got at number four is ace of spades by motorhead um in terms of heavy metalness there's people who might say i should have put overkill in but for me it's it says my it says my in the title and for me it has to be ace of spades it's their greatest album all right, and uh, but Overkill's pretty. They're all brilliant. What I'm gonna say, you know, we're, we're the, we we have now the top three heavy metal albums of all time, in my opinion. So what have I got at number three? They have to be on the list. I think it would be a bit of a cheat to put them at number one, even though these guys did invent the genre. I think it's Black Sabbath. So which album? Right, so for me, Black Sabbath go like this. They come out with this sort of blue, heavy blues rock album, Black Sabbath, with all this horror imagery. That's the beginning of heavy metal. Then we have Paranoid, and 1970, they consolidate it, and Paranoid is just the first out-and-out -out heavy metal album. Then you get Masses of Reality, and then you get uh, Volume 4, and these are the four masterpiece metal albums for me and they're all equal in their brilliance then they start to explore and go off on tangents and you start to get progressive elements coming in and other genres creeping and it's all very interesting and all really brilliant but the heavy metalness is is on those first four albums my favorite album of those those four is uh volume four without a doubt that's always been my favorite but the album i'm going to put on the list i think which is in terms of its influence it's important what it achieved for heavy metal is paranoid, right? I think that's the one that has to go on the list here. You know, I think this is possibly like the 10th album I bought in my life, you know, well, maybe the sixth. It's been with me since the beginning of time. It's the first Black Sabbath album I ever bought. Um, once I bought Sabbath, that was it, you know. It, it, they sort of even eclipsed a lot of the new wave of British heavy metal bands in terms of heaviness. You know, Sabbath have this throb. They're, 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 they're they're actually completely different to every other heavy metal band. Um, Ozzy's performance, his vocal style, the, the, the way he commands the stage, the pure joy that's in that man, the fact that you feel like he's enjoying every minute. It's not doom and gloom. It's, he's enjoying every minute of it. They, they are joyful. They're a joyful band. And they have this sound, which isn't all clicky double bass drums and in-your-face guitars. It sounds like the scariest band He's rehearsing very loud in the room next door. That was always the production sound they had. 
Um, and the sound is them. It's them that are heavy, not the production. And it's doomy and it's dark. And I think I'm paranoid. They just nail it. Absolutely nail it. If you want to know more, then now go over to my video where I, my dumb history of heavy metal part one, where I really go deep into the genius of Black Sabbath. And on that video, I make the point that the genius of Black Sabbath is the fact that they are so dumb. It's true punk rock. It's music that is attractive to young teenage boys, I suppose who don't want to faff around with a bunch of pretentious nonsense. They want something which is dumb and bang your head against the wall, inane, heavy nonsense. That's what they want and that's what Sabbath do brilliantly and they do it on Proud So that's what I've got at number three. All right, what have I got at number two? At number two, I have Number of the Beast. There had to be a new wave of British heavy metal album on there. Um, and... Uh, I nearly put uh, Diamond Head on here. Nearly was going to put Diamond Head on here because I think they're so important and so influential on the thrash metal bands that came in afterwards. But it has to be Number of the Beast. This is this is the high point of New Wave of British Heavy Metal. For me, Heavy Metal is defined in that moment. So it's logically defined in this album, which I think it is. You know, I think um, everything that Heavy Metal does is completely defined within Number of the Beast. It's got everything that you'd ever want from a heavy metal album. It's a brilliant album. There's not a bad track on there. It's Iron Maiden at their peak. Um, and I think it's um, the addition of the vocal virtuosity of Bruce Dickinson, which allows Iron Maiden at this point to bring in the inevitable progressive rock influences that are there all the way throughout the development of heavy metal. If you look at the biggest heavy metal bands, they are conceptual in nature. They don't use normal pop song formats. They use extended formats, instrumental virtuosity, um, the exploration of time. Yeah, different to progressive rock bands, but still complex um, in the use of blast beats and weird timings and all that sort of stuff. The progressive element is a key element uh, in um, in the development of heavy metal. So many bands have been a part of this, um, but I think Iron Maiden is so important in bringing that aspect in, and they just nail it. Um, I believe that Number of the Beast is equally a progressive rock album as it is a heavy metal album, but my God, it's a heavy metal album. And at this point, if you want to know more about what I think about that album, go over to my big video on Number of the Beast and have a listen to that. We've got a whole bunch of stuff here. So I'm, I'm at number one. And anybody watching this video will be aware that there's been a big exclusion so far. I haven't talked about one of the biggest bands in history. And I would argue perhaps the biggest American band in history. Right? Because all the other massive, Ameri uh, uh, massive uh, rock bands are British, aren't they? The Beatles, Rolling Stone, you know, The Police. They're all British. But there's one band that is just sort of achieved overwhelming success. Hundreds of millions of albums sold, and that, of course, is Metallica. I can remember going to see Chris Cornell um, live once, and he got up and he did a version of One. And this version of One was the U2 song, the music of the song One by U2, but sung with the lyrics of One by Metallica. And when I saw Chris Cornell live, he made the point that he, he thought it was a wonderful thing and a testament to the greatness of heavy metal that a band could write a song with this subject matter and it sell millions and millions. And he said when he Googled the song one, it wasn't the U2 one that came up. It was the Metallica one. This is a testament to the huge success power, influence, um, the huge effects of Metallica in the music industry. So why is that? Because of Critical Cell, this is uncom uncompromising stuff. As I said earlier, I heard Metallica when the first album came out and I thought as a young guy hearing that, that um, it must have been a band with about six guitarists in, that they had such a heavy sound. 
Now, of course, um, Lars Ulrich, who is, the, is a real driving force behind this band, he um, had come over to the UK in the early 80s and had sort of followed Brian Tatler around from Diamond Head. Uh, Diamond Head are a band, metal band, that come just up the road. I'm pointing down there as though that's where Brian Tatler and Diamond Head are from, but they're not, but they are just literally up the road there. And I spoke to Brian a number of times about this and he said that, you know, Lars Ulrich would come and stop at his house um, and he would pick his brains. He was, he was working out what was going on in this new wave of British heavy metal thing, you know. You know what I'm like, I, I always have to in the end, you know, I'm like one of those guys where the, it's, the British are responsible for everything. And um, yes, British people are responsible for heavy metal. It's Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden. Diamond Head. But we're not responsible for uh, Metallica, are we? But are we? Because I believe Lars Ulrich, who's not an American anyway, came over to here and stole the idea from us British of what heavy metal should be. But he delivered. And uh, on a series of albums throughout the 80s, you know, the second album, Ride the Lightning, and then the third album, Master of Puppets, by Master of Puppets, the idea of thrash metal, which is which is basically for me, is a distillation of the all the elements we've been talking about in this video. All the elements distilled onto one album. And our master of puppets, they nail it. And that's what I have at number one is master of puppets, right? I think it is inarguably the greatest metal album. I think if we wanted to send an album into space to, rev, you know, represent what heavy metal was to aliens across the galaxy i would send the master of puppets um from that point on metallica then make and justice for all which was eagerly awaited and knocked us out you know at the time it was i can remember hearing one and think it was brilliant but you know there's always been the question of the production on Ju and justice for all it was a double album and they sort of overreached themselves it's, it's not as concise and uniformly genius as Master of Puppets is, then, against everything that they'd represented, they then go commercial with the Black Album, creating a whole new fan base that absolutely love them for that album. And there's, I'm sure there's people here, younger people, that would think that the Black Album should be, but no. We know, don't we? It's Master of Puppets. That's the album you have here. I was very disappointed with Metallica at that point. Um, I now need to tell you my Metallica story. Um, when I did the video on my gig experiences, I told you about my friend, you know, Matthew Bourne. He was like my partner in crime back then. We were both big metal fans. He was at the Monsters of Rock Festival, you know, when we watched Dave Lee Roth and those, the terrible... You know, two of the audience were crushed to death um, in 1988. He was, was with me then. He was with me so often. I said about the guy that would try to get me into Voivod back in the early 80s, late 80s. And that was Matt again. He, he's, and I hope he's watching this video. Um, but Matt, the biggest regret <laughs> I've got, or one of the regrets I've got, is... Um, on the Master of Puppets tour, I would think it would be the Master of Puppets tour... Matt went to see Metallica. He goes for a drink before the gig and in the pub are Metallica with Cliff Burton and he sits down and he starts drinking and he spends the afternoon with them and he's getting on so much with them that he rings me up from a call box and says, come up Birmingham, I'm hanging out with Metallica. And I didn't go. I didn't go and hang out and meet Cliff Burton. I didn't meet Metallica. And I tell you why, because I was an Anthrax fan. I wasn't a massive fan of Metallica, right? But I think as time has gone on, looking back, I think without a doubt, what they achieved on Master of Puppets is a sublime platonic representation of what heavy metal is, which is why I've got it at number one on my list. So I'm going to recap now. So what I have had is at number 10, Nothing Face by Voivod. At number nine, Blizzard of Oz by Ozzy Osbourne. At number eight, Sin After Sin by Judas Priest. Contentious choice there. Um, at number seven, Among the Living uh, by Anthrax. At number six, Vulgar Display of Power by Pantera. 
At number five, Super Unknown by Soundgarden. At number four, Ace of Spades by Motorhead. At number three, Paranoid by Black Sabbath. At number two, I have, I've just spoken about it in a I have Number of the Beast by Iron Maiden. God, when you get old, you forget stuff so quick. And at number one, Master of Puppets by Metallica. How did I do? What do you think? Was that okay? Was it nailed? Now, let's get on to the next bit. Um, I have been helping out a up-and-comping metal band, right? These guys are young. They're into modern metal. I haven't got any modern metal on my list. And I, that is always a big problem in my channel because I'm an old bloke and I tend to go for the old stuff. And I know you all like the old stuff. But I went to the two guys out of Man Made Hell. This is the band that I'm helping at the moment. And I said, you come up with your top 10 greatest metal albums of all time. And I'm going to ring out, read out both lists. Firstly, by CJ, who is the lead singer of Man Made Hell. And if you want to check out Man Made Hell, in the description below will be a link to their... Um, one of their records, one of their videos, and I hope you go and watch them and 